Hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> so good to be with you and to discuss such an amazing thing as this newest book that you have. <laughs> yes. It's been such an adventure creating this book because it's really taken me 40 years to get this book into shape. It's called Becoming God, 108 Translations of Angelus Silesius. That sounds madly esoteric, but Angelus Silesius is actually one of the most important universal mystics that we have. He lived in the 17th century, and in his 30s, he went through a shattering, amazing transfiguration experience in which he experienced viscerally becoming divine. He experienced the dream at the core of human evolution. And he wrote 1,600 epigrams. I translated 800 of them into rhyming couplets because they're rhyming couplets in the original. Then read them and they were so clunky, I burned them one night. And then I had the inspiration, no, go for the direct speech, go for direct, clear manifestations of these epigrams. And that's the book. The reason why I feel it's so important, this book, the work of Angela Silesius is that I believe we're going through a mutation, not a transformation. I believe that we're going through an evolutionary shift so immense that it can only be described as a mutation of the intensest kind. And if you want an image of the mutation, think of what happens to a caterpillar in a cocoon, it melts down completely, imaginal cells wake up, the body of a completely new creature is constituted, which then breaks free and becomes the butterfly. I think that's what's happening to the human race. I think we're going through the global dark night that could potentially birth a wholly different kind of human being, a consciously divine, embodied human being. And we need more than oxygen now, the witness of those who have been through this astounding progress and process. And that's why I produced this book, so that people could read the news of their new evolutionary destiny. Because I believe the whole human race is now in this crucible of mutation. And that guides like Angelus Silesius are going to be more precious than oxygen. Mm. Beautifully said, I completely agree. One of the things that uh, really stuck out for me in, in this book are the paradoxes, of course, as many great teachings have. And that's so up for people right now. Uh, polarities are really up for people, clients that come to me, people that are in my classes and courses. And, and in our world, you know, you can see the, uh, the, the opposites really at work in the world. And so, this is a well, the ultimate opposite is what we're living. We're living a global dark night in which all of the ideals and agendas and institutions that we have cherished are being systematically annihilated. Mm. And if you look at this from the position of the ego, all you can feel is paralysis, terror, dread, horror. But if you look at it from the understanding of the great mystical systems, you realize that this deconstruction at the savagest level is potentially the birth canal of a new humanity. What about that for a paradox? That's the <laughs> exactly. ultimate dance of opposites. And that's what we're in. We're in this vast dance in which the extremist possibilities imaginable are being presented to us for our choice. Yeah. And, and there's not really a choice, is there? No. <laughs> there's not really well, a choice. There isn't really a choice between total annihilation and the birth of a new humanity that can co-create with God a new world and a new way of being and doing everything. But we have to be aware of what that choice demands, what it costs, what it requires, and what it is asking of all of us to pursue at this moment, because otherwise we'll miss this stupendous opportunity and the world will descend into flaming chaos and into the abyss of destruction. Right. Well, it's it's interesting that you, you know, you gave birth to this book and then you killed it. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> so that was part of your transfiguration process on some small scale, wasn't it? A little bit, or at least it mirrored. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
Well, I can't claim to be transfigured. I can claim one thing only, and that is to know that it's possible and that to be at the fringes of the fringes of this great transformation. I don't think anyone has gone to the end of it for the simple reason that it's so extreme. Right. What I've understood is that it's taking place in me and in hundreds of thousands of other people. And that's the information that I'm sharing as much as I know. Sure. Well, a while ago, I had shared with you that the, your book of Kabir Epigrams, uh, Becoming Gold, that my husband and I used it at our breakfast table to just randomly open and uh, read, read a page. And sometimes that page would elicit an hour of conversation. <laughs> well, it's so, yes. <laughs> and so when I received Becoming God, we decided to do the same thing. Thank and of you. course, um, you know, in, in fact, Steve mentioned just a few minutes ago, you know, you could talk about this book for a year. You could meet yes. Andrew every day for a year and talk about this book. Um, and so... Every epigram is really a telegram from super consciousness, from transfigured consciousness. So you can unpack it in a hundred thousand ways. That's what's so astonishing about what Angela Silesius has done. Right, right. And, and you know, one of the fun things about, about this book, is, about the epigrams and the way you've translated them, is that you can look at them and, and they're an end result. <laughs> and then you can backtrack and, and go through the steps to get there in a way. It's, it's just, it's a fascinating, it's been a fascinating journey for us. Um, so that's kind of what I, that's how I wanted to start this conversation Jeez. is with the, with the paradoxes. So I randomly opened a page and it was page 62. And it says, if you can't die joyfully, you've got no will to live. The life you're hungry for only death can give. Mm. So that um, is at the key of the dark night. Mm -hmm. Because what we're being offered on a global level is the chance to die to die to our fantasies, to die to our greed, to die to our magical thinking, to die to our belief that we are the most cherished forms in this creation, to die to our insane hubris and arrogance, and to die into divine love, into the life of the Godhead, into the truth, the truth of a flaming conscience, passionate for compassion and action and justice if we can choose to die joyfully into that vast life then we can be reborn in it as a form of it as a hologram of it divinized in mind and heart and soul and body mm. that's the choice that's before us and that's what angelus silesius makes abundantly and radiantly clear in those four lines he gives it directly only death this death of the false self can give us access to the life of the transfigured embodied divine self this is something that the greatest mystics have always known this is something that Rumi experienced and he wrote about it most excitingly I think of anyone in his great poem the grapes of my body can only become wine mm. after the winemaker tramples me. Mm. I surrender my body like grapes to his trampling so my inmost heart can blaze and dance with joy. And although the grapes go on sobbing blood and screaming, I cannot bear any more anguish. I cannot bear any more cruelty. The trampler stuffs cotton in his ears and says it is I who am the master of this work. You can deny me if you want, you have every excuse, but when through my passion you reach perfection, you will never be done praising my name. Mm. So what Rumi's poem does is flesh out those four lines of Silesius and show you what is at stake in this mystical death that we're all being challenged now to mm -hmm. undergo joyfully because we can see what's on the other side. People like Angela Silesius in this book, Becoming God, give us a taste of the transfigured consciousness of the embodied divine human. And that taste is thrilling. So 
anything we need to go through to be that taste living is worth it. Yes. Well, and to bring that down a little bit to our, our real world. <laughs> yes. we start, so we start out way up here. <laughs> to bring that down a little bit, we... Well, it's we, way in here, actually. These are here. the archetypal laws that then we need to enact in ordinary reality. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the opposites of life and death, uh, you know, opposites are just two extremes of the same thing. And as you mentioned, our, our ego fears death. Uh, but to our soul, it's only another experience. It's not right. not the end of anything. And, um, you, you know, I think all of our anxiety, tell me if you agree with this, all anxiety that we feel as, as mere humans is the fear that one opposite will cancel out the other one forever. Absolutely, because we haven't understood deeply enough that God is a dance of opposites. And that in each of the opposites, there is a seed of the other. This is the beauty of the yin and yang diagram. Mm -hmm. So when you're going through a very, very dark period, all you can imagine is more darkness, more defeat, more grief. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if you step back and allow the process to happen, all kinds of new forces, new possibilities are born out of the experience itself. This is amazing and very, very healing. It is. So, you know, one of the things that, that came up in our conversation over breakfast about this was in one of my hermetic courses, we, uh, we delved into life and death and the fears that we have around death. And of course, as you know, if we're, if we're fearing and avoiding death, we're fearing and avoiding life. And yes. that's what some of the people came to is their fear of death really had to do with a fear of really living. That yes. It was, it was a fascinating thing. And so when you do these, when you break down opposites like that, you know, if I'm hopeless, I must also be hopeful. If I'm uh, afraid, I must also be courageous. When you break these down and know that they're just various degrees of the same thing, it's-, it's Yes, they're different intensities of energy from the one experience that is a dance of all of these opposites. Exactly, exactly. Right. And when you know that, you know, and it's such a simple thing, isn't it? It, it, it is. It and is a simple thing, but it requires a great deal of spaciousness of awareness. And that's what we need to cultivate. We need to cultivate that vast, spacious, alert consciousness that belongs to us as divine awareness. And when you're in that state, the secret information and anything that's happening is given to you in glimpses so that you can collaborate with the birth of the new out of the death of the old. This is something very practical. It sounds very grand, but it's actually very practical. For example, I've just been through the necessity to not do something that I was very passionate about, and it was very painful not to do it. But I knew that my choice not to do it was a good one, so I waited, and amazing new possibilities that I hadn't dreamt of appeared and I was able to work with them quickly because I wasn't addicted to the story. So not to get addicted to the story of what's happening, not to crystallize it too firmly, to stay in a state of spaciousness and unknowing so that the divine can guide you to the sometimes astounding, unprecedented new possibilities that have been born out of what you're going through. This mm -hmm. is everybody can practice in the core of their lives and should practice because in the end it brings a revelation of the way in which divine grace works which is nearly always paradoxically yeah. <laughs> you think you're losing everything and in fact you're being shown a door into a room in which you'll be given far far more than you ever imagined you could contain this is well God's play. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And it, there's always a door. There's always at least a window. You know, yes. I, I, I'm so amazed at the times that I thought there is no other way out. There is no other answer. And, and there always is. There always is. We bring well, there's a way up. It's not always a way out. It's <laughs> a way up. You, you, you're not trapped in the room. You can go through the top of the ceiling onto the roof and then look down at the room and what's going on in the room from a completely different perspective. When Ramana Maharshi was dying of throat cancer, which is extremely painful, the doctor asked him, are you in pain? And Ramana said, pain is in the room. Mm -hmm. And 
that's an extraordinary comment because he's saying, yes, there's pain, but I am not identified with this pain. It is happening, but it doesn't exhaust my attention. My attention is global. My attention is universal. This is happening. I accept it. I can find a way to live with it and not let it crowd everything. Mm-hmm. Isn't that wonderful? It's so beautiful. Yeah. It is. And that's something every human being needs to practice at this moment because we're in a crisis so immense that it's very easy to get distracted by the craziness and the violence and the cruelty and the madness of what's happening. Mm-hmm. It's human to get distracted in those ways. But if we allow that distraction to take our minds over, we're not going to be aware of the ways in which this great death is also offering us an unprecedented birth, a birth of a unified humanity dedicated to compassion and justice in action. This is arising. We can see it in the young and extinction rebellion. We can hear it in the Me Too movement. We can hear it in movements all over the world and the Iranian students protesting against the craziness of the Ayatollahs. We, it's happening on the earth, this birth. And I think that the responsibilities of all, of all mystics and of all spiritual people is to become agents of this birth in their own individual transformation and in their sacred activism in the world. Well, and that's the thing, and you know, this is actually a great segue, I believe into the next epigram that I, that I randomly chose, of course, but uh, interesting, you know, I watch the activism in the world and some of it is not sacred. <laughs> no. You know, some of it is, is really feeding the pendulum swing that will come back and hit us. Um, and, and then a lot of it yeah. is, is a higher consciousness. But this is why I think it's so important to study things like, like her, the Hermetic principles, uh, you know, like Kabir, uh, like they, you know, your book, Becoming God, because we, we just have to rise above this, uh, this fear and anger uh, and po- finger pointing, I guess, that, that is going well, on. Well, some kind of anger is essential, I think. I think we have to transmute anger, not repress anger. Well, it's exactly. very important to be angry at what the corporations are doing. They are doing terrible things. They're holding the world hostage at a moment when we know the climate is collapsing. That is a terrible thing yeah. to do. And we need to be angry at that. But we need to transmute that anger into fierce compassion energy, into real action. And also we need to acknowledge our own responsibility, our own shadow that's keeping these shadows alive. So that anger can't be finger pointing. Mm-hmm. Unless that finger is also pointing at yourself for all the ways in which you conspire with this world of devouring greed that's destroying sure. everything. That's sacred consciousness. Sacred consciousness does not mean you don't get angry. It means that you make a commitment to implicate yourself in whatever's happening too. And you make a commitment to transmute that anger into the energy to actually turn up and do something real about what your heart broke. Around. Well, yes, and don't you think when we when we do that shadow work, when we when we have the emotions and we we take a pause and do that inner work, that anger that anger anger <laughs> that anger turns into resolve, more resolve. Right. Yeah. Right. This this takes us into this ne- next epigram. Uh, it's page fifteen. The drop becomes the sea when it enters into it, and the soul becomes God when it drowns in Him. So beautiful, and of course, uh, it speaks to the return, the the uh, the birth from love that we are, and the return to love, and also so much more. It reminded me of what Kabir said, and I had to look that up to get it exactly. All know that the drop merges into the ocean, but few know that the ocean merges into the drop. That's extraordinary. It is. And I think even from A Course in Miracles and and from science, the part contains the whole. Uh, In Hermetic Principles, this would be the principle of correspondence. So there's all different ways to to look at this. And I I think... um, The ultimate way is really the ancient way of looking at this as the revelation of the self. hmm. That through some unbelievable unknowable magic of God, all of us have as original blessing self 
consciousness. And as we awaken to being, not our self, but the self, mm -hmm. we become aware that this drop that we are through this same unknowable magic contains the entire universe and all universes and has direct access to the staggering intelligence and energy and passion and beauty and lucidity and clarity of the universal self mm. that's what kabir is talking about and that's what all of those who have been graced super consciousness tell us they tell us that we have absolutely no idea of who we are because we're trapped in this fantasy of being a separate ego and when that starts to dissolve it's terrifying at the beginning. It's terrifying for quite a while because where are you? But if you can hang in there and keep doing the practices and keep realizing that this is actually a birth, when you are born, then you know that you're not this dying, crazy, karmically challenged being. You are in fact total being radiating through this unique lens that is the great discovery waiting everyone and when you discover that when that becomes real to you then something even more extraordinary starts to happen which is that you through that discovery realize that you're saturated with the self that your body itself is an instrument of the self a manifestation of crystallized light consciousness and at that moment a process is activated that can transform not only your mind not only your heart but also the actual substance of your body so that your body slowly becomes a different kind of matter of light matter the mm -hmm. new species this is what kabir discovered and this is what Silesius discovered, and that's why I've spent so much time making these transfiguration mystics available now for us. So important. And don't you find that, you know, we've had little glimpses, we have little, maybe we're not where Kabir is and Silesius is, but we have these glimpses of this that we can, uh, we can at least remember. <laughs> you know what I mean? We have little glimpses of that state of being. I think it's more than that, Donnie. I think that we're when you realize or begin to who these people are mm -hmm. they become touchstones of your inner experience they show you constantly what's possible mm -hmm. and that enables you to place yourself on this expanding map and realize how much work there is still to be done and that's very important because our spiritual movement is so self-indulgent and narcissistic it believes many people believe they're already totally awake when you read kabir and silesius you realize your awakening needs a lot of gardening before it can actually flower in this total security and in this engoldenment that they're speaking of that's very important because we need people who constantly challenge us to go far deeper, far wider, far more intensely, devotedly towards God. Mm. Mm. Isn't that so? I think that if you, if you look at our spiritual movement, it has become so flattering to relatively ordinary states of consciousness it gives oh. people the illusion that the beginning of the path is the end of the path the right. beginning of the path is the beginning of the path there's so much more ahead and why i devoted myself to the great mystics of humanity is because they know this they've lived the huge vast path and they're speaking like rumi and kabir and silesius out of the core of that knowledge and that knowledge is now crucial for our survival, not just our liberation. That would be amazing enough, but it's now crucial for our survival as a human race because it gives us something to aspire to and something to remember as our essential birthright, something that transcends the very banal images of what human beings are that are given to us by our culture, which is a depraved and stupid culture. <laughs> Well, I, yes, I, I agree with that. And where you started with that, I believe, was, uh, 
you know, the self-indulgent spiritual movement and, and, uh, you know, I meet, I meet these people a lot that, uh, and, and maybe I've been one of these people as well, or I couldn't, Me too. Yeah. I wouldn't have understood them, but that, you know, that believe that they've reached that point when they've just begun. And it's so fascinating that the further toward that point you get, I think the more you realize you are so far away. <laughs> Yes. And, and it's such a humbling experience. I mean, just from it the little is. voices I've had, such a humbling experience because it's really an uncovering. Anybody can do this. You don't have to spend millions of dollars to go to, you know, to go train with a guru. <laughs> it's no. all in here. And it, it all depends on the intensity of your insincerity, doesn't it? It does. How sincere are you? How passionate are you? You don't need a guru. You need to turn up with your whole being blazing with devotion to God and with a commitment to keep emptying yourself of everything you think you know so that you can be filled with more and more. With that, you can go anywhere. You can be taken anywhere with grace. But that requires radical humility, radical devotion, radical sincerity. And How that's a lot to ask. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. And I wonder what you think about this. How important is it, or is it important at all, <laughs> that we learn things to eventually let them go, that we learn certain things to eventually unlearn them? Do we have to understand one thing in order to then in the future let that go and understand something greater? What's, what's your take on that? I think it's essential mm -hmm. to allow the mind to be so penetrated by the light that it becomes increasingly clear as it's taken into realm after realm of expansion. Because if you keep your mind clear or grace keeps it clear for you, in you, you can then help people at all of these different levels. You can understand where they are, what they need at the level that they need, what they're temptations will be, what their difficulties will be, where they could be blocked. You'll also be able to accompany them as they go through the excruciating and hilarious process of having to unlearn everything that they've learned at that level. So trying to keep your intellect tuned by the light to be clear enough about what is at stake in every level is what will it eventually make you a capable and loving and compassionate and rigorous guide to others in this evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And don't forget it, that this evolutionary process is the birthing process of a wholly new kind of human being, and that includes a wholly new kind of consciousness. And that consciousness is very, very different from mental consciousness. It has all the powers of clarity of mental consciousness. But because of its vastness and wideness, it's seeing everything from every conceivable angle at the same time and making judgments not based on binary separations of, of categorization. It's experiencing everything at the same time and with a divine lucidity and able to move in paradox effortlessly. That's the new mind, but mm -hmm. it's a mind. It isn't a vague feeling. It's a new consciousness and you need to train and train and train at every single level mm -hmm. to be able to hold the astounding clarities that will come when you begin to be born into divine humanity. So this, uh, this reconciliation, it's a reconciliation, really. Wouldn't you describe it like that? I think it's a discovery of the real mind. And the real mind isn't the mental mind. The real mind is the what, is, what arises when the heart and the mind marry, mm -hmm. when the heart center opens and the mind becomes the servant of the revelations of unity that the heart center reveals. And that transforms the mind and mind and heart come together and become one organ of living perception and truth. That's the new divine human. Mm -hmm. But isn't that reconciling? And I don't, I mean, I mean, I'm just asking your opinion. Isn't that reconciling heart and mind? Isn't, aren't we reconciling uh, in some way uh, human and divine?
I hear you. I think that's a wonderful way of putting it. But I would say that what the journey is really doing is revealing that being finally human is being divine because the divine so penetrates us at every level. Mm -hmm. What I'm discovering isn't so much a reconciliation of the human and the divine, but a revelation that the divine is the human mm -hmm. and that you're never more divine than when you are more truly human. Mm -hmm. Being truly human means to me being having integrity, having a living conscience, being tender, being awake to others' pain, being passionate to help in whatever way you can. What is that but divine truth and virtue? That's the revelation. Right. We've made this separation between human and divine, which has caused a catastrophe mm -hmm. because we've usually judged ourselves horribly. But what about reversing that and understanding at the deepest level that the divine is living a unique experience through our humanity and that our humanity is secretly divine and that if we can retrain ourselves to be more truly our deep human selves, those deep human selves will open like a fan yeah. onto inherent divinity. So it goes beyond reconciliation, I think. I think it does. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that what you read when you read the Gospels? I, when I read the Gospels, of course, I, I experience Jesus as this astounding miracle worker and walking on water and all of that. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But the most amazing part of Jesus is his intense beauty of kindness, of presence, of, kind, of compassion, of deep, deep humanity. That's the revelation. Right. Beautiful. He's not dissociated from humanity. He doesn't say humanity is evil. He's trying to say, look, be totally human. You'll discover that that total humanity is already divine. And that will give you a thrill. And from that thrill, you'll be able to build. And slowly, your whole being will be turned to gold, will be Christ in. Right. That's what happened to him, and that's what he was sharing with us, and that's what the great evolutionary mystics are sharing with us. I guess I, my perspective is a little bit different because one of the things that I, one of the things that I do in my life is to reconcile science and spirit. I, I right. think um, I, I don't know who it was. Maybe Einstein said that science would eventually prove that there was a God. And, and so and that's those, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. With the, mm. you know, the, the hologram, I love that. And that, that has to do with correspondence as well. And this epigram is that, you know, when you divide a hologram into a thousand pieces, each tiny little part is not a piece. It's the whole, the whole hologram right. is within that piece. And so right. fascinating, you know, what we can learn by studying other systems, what we can learn about ourselves, oh, yes. what we can learn about other universes <laughs> by studying what is right in front of us. It's just a fascinating journey, isn't it? It's utterly amazing. And it, that is one of the great excitements of our time, I think, what you just described, the fact that quantum physics is now opening onto the field. And the field is what the great mystics have experienced forever. They've experienced the whole universe as this dancing field of light energy. They know that it is. And they know that attuning yourself to that attunes you to limitless possibilities of transformation and transfiguration because the field is a field of endless expansion. Now, science is opening to that, but because science is still rooted in the desire to know and control and understand, mm -hmm. it doesn't go as far as the mystical systems do yeah. because the mystical systems tell us that we will never be able to completely understand and that we've got to be able to stay in a state of unknowing mm -hmm. and that we need to approach the field with radiant humility and adoration in order to be endlessly expanded by it and in order not to use the powers that it will give us in the way that we've used all the other powers that have actually conspired to create this devastating situation. Yeah, sure. So I don't... There again, it's 
it's not a reconciliation, it's a dance, isn't it? It's a, I love the word dance because dance doesn't mean you merge with something else, mm -hmm. but you dance with what is consonant in it with your deepest principles. So mysticism and science are not reconciling, they're doing a dazzling complex dance together now. And both have to hold their own truth. Science has to say it has to be proven. We have to, as far as possible, get this as clear as possible. That has to be science's position. Mm -hmm. And the mystics have to hold their position and say, however clear you get, what you're describing is something that will always be beyond all powers of description. And we need to stay reverent and humble before it, because if we don't, catastrophe will unfold. And that's not reconciliation. It's a dance in which both come deeply to respect the other and potentially to listen to each other. This is going to be the big challenge for science because the scientists have not shown themselves spectacularly humble in face of the inner sciences, although we've had great scientists like Heisenberg and Pauli and Einstein himself who have been convinced mystics. But the majority of those in the scientific establishment are drunk on the power of science. So mm -hmm. this is going to be fascinating. It is. And, and I think dissolving, uh, dissolving into the midpoint is, is, uh, is, is sort of like saying there's a dance, uh, of course. But I think that eventually, uh, yeah, the, the science and the spirit, that's where the, what I call reconciliation, but that's probably not the right term. No, you I love it. I think it's but, a beautiful um, term because reconciliation, when you go into it, I can be reconciled with you. You remain you and I remain me. Sure. But we find a place of peace from which we communicate. Right. And I think that if that's what you mean by reconciliation, it's a wonderful word. Right. But I think it's going to take a great deal, don't you? Oh, my goodness. Yes. It's going to take a great deal for the human race to get out of the boxes that it likes to live in for security's sake, which is, have nothing whatever to do with the free, wild, dynamic play of the dance of Shiva, the real dance of transfiguration. Well, and that's the beautiful thing is that we you know, creator keeps giving herself away. <laughs> we keep changing and evolving. Nothing is at rest, as they say, everything's Nothing. in motion. And so you are not the same Andrew as you were when we began this, and I'm not the same Raven. We bring our old stories into it. We try to inform this present moment with that. And that's what we have to be aware of, I think, as, as, as a world, as a planet, is, is uh, having the balance with the old stories to inform us but then creating new in each moment and, and realizing that we are new in each moment. What, what's your thought on that? I think it's, that's true. And I think what I've been doing for many years now is choosing those parts of the old story that are really essential for the new. Mm -hmm. There are many parts of the old story which we just need to abandon because they've created this terrifying crisis. Mm -hmm. But there are some parts which we're not aware of, which we've lost contact with, but which are absolutely essential to the new story. Because what is entangled in the old story is the story of those who have actually woken up to the potential birth of a new humanity, the Rumis, the Kabirs, mm -hmm. the Angelus Silesiuses, the Jesuses. We need their story like oxygen to give us the guts, the stamina, the passion, the hope, the faith to undergo this transformation now. They can't do it for us. What they can do is what they have done, which is lay out a map, based on their own experience, give us these astounding teachings which have been forgotten and shelved and misunderstood. Let's get that part of the old story back to give us the immense energy that we're going to need to allow the new story to be born in us. Mm. This has happened before. I mean, the, in all of the great shifts of humanity, there have been people on the earth who've said, we have to move away from this, but we cannot afford to lose this. Because if we lose this, we lose the divine truth that's at the core of this evolutionary impulse. Mm. There's a very great danger, you see, at this moment, Raven, in the cult of science. And I know you know this, I've been studying a lot about the recent developments in AI and quite honestly, some of them truly appall me because 
what some of the adventurers in AI are planning are, <laughs> is nothing less than playing God and designing a new human race, designer babies, using AI to marry human and cyborg in ways that could be absolutely nightmarish and horrific and actually speed up the destruction. Mm. So mm. are we going to tell the story that is the divine story of human transformation? Or are we going to go on being drunk on our own power, especially on this new technology, and try and play God? And if we do try and play God, we will inevitably create our annihilation. God is not going to be mocked. And the field will not allow manipulation on that scale. It will self-destruct in a way that will be potentially the end of everything. So a lot is at stake. Uh, so can you tell. Yeah. Isn't so, it? Oh, it is. Absolutely. And I right. was was trying to be a little mindful of time. Um, and I wanted to shake things up a bit. With shake things up. The gram. <laughs> um, let me get it here. Okay. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that Silesius evokes all of this, that here we are diving in and out and expanding like this. This is exactly what I hope when people come to this book, that they won't just read this book, mm -hmm. but they'll engage with each epigram because it's like a flash of lightning from your own deepest mind coming towards you and you take it in and you think, oh, now what? Let me let me dance with this with my whole being and see what comes up that's what we're doing that's so exciting oh, it is. it's so i hope everyone will order this book it's so important and just to throw this in i know we're we're trying to keep time to a minimum but this is so important oh let's go on let's let's dance when you came to Asheville uh to give a workshop for for my community you uh did a workshop on the the becoming gold and yes so this was sort of a last minute thing that we, we didn't know exactly what you were going to talk about. And one of the participants came up to me at the end and she said, you know, I had a really busy weekend. This is a really busy time in my life. And when I got the email that Andrew was going to potentially read poetry to us, I thought, oh no, can I really do this? Is this how I should spend my time? And she, you know, of course she was laughing at herself because she was completely, it changed her life <laughs> as it did so for all of us. Uh, we really, we talk about, our community talks about us before Andrew and us after Andrew. That's actually the thing that we say. So, you know, you, you really made such an impact and it was just so. Well, I love your community. They're serious people. They're gracious people. They're humble people. They're really working with authentic stuff because of the, wonderful hermetic tradition that you represent and introduce to them. They're not people who believe that they know everything. And that's mm -hmm. such a thrill for a teacher because then we can explore mystery sure. together. Sure. Well, Very few communities have the range that yours does. Thank you so much for having poured so much of your soul and heart and life energy into creating, being co-creator of such a community. Thank you. Thank you. We love you as well. Um, so let's throw in this last epigram. It's page 35 for those who have the book. Friend, let the world go its willful way. Its acts are nothing but a tragic play. So this, this can shake things up a, a bit about, you know, what we've talked about. Um, and I, well, I think, don't you think it's a very, very profound piece of information? It's not the whole information, I don't think. But it's saying to everybody, if this is a mutation that we're going through, and if this is a global dark night, mm -hmm. there are going to be simply terrifying things happening. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be overreactive at all moments to those terrifying things, you're going to go crazy and be of absolutely no use to anyone. So, what Angela Silesius is speaking of is the fundamental detachment, unattachment, mm -hmm. that you're going to need to stay aligned with this vaster process that is exploding in all of these opposites. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you don't 
react to what's going on in the tragic play because from that place of unattachment you will be given the wisdom to make significant contributions when they appear mm -hmm. and you'll know how to do it when to do it and with what intensity and pressure to do it and that's part of being a transfigured human being is acting with great compassion married as the tibetans say to the wisdom of emptiness to the wisdom of unattachment and from that place that mysterious place in which the opposites of profound unattachment and profound compassion come together you can become through grace an instrument of enlightened intelligence enlightened truth absolutely so if you read that those four lines and just say that's it that will only be half of it because <laughs> that will be that will build the wisdom side but then what of the compassion? What of what you are compelled to react to out of the depths of your heart? That's sacred activism. So what I feel more and more, and this is something that I really have come to through working with Kabir and working with Angela Sagisis. And you know, when I say working with, it's not really working with, it's being saturated by. I don't feel I've worked with Kabir. I feel that I've been in this furnace where i've been progressively cabirized to be able to dare to begin to begin to speak of kabir and to translate him similarly with silesia so they they merge inside one they come into you they possess you they instruct you that's what's happened inside me and what i've come to understand is that what we're asked to do in this birthing process is something amazing we're asked to on the one hand pursue the transfiguration process ourselves through prayer, through meditation, through deep expansion of our spiritual knowledge, and through opening our whole being to the infusion of divine evolutionary grace. And we're being called upon to act in the tragic play, but knowing that it's a play and keeping that calm and that spaciousness so as to make our actions so much more effective. So for me, Transfiguration process and sacred activism are two sides of the new sun of the birth that's being that's rising in the sky of our humanity now. Oh. So another way to look at that is, well, you know, the play or the game, the, the point of the game is always the game. And so to know that it's a game doesn't trivialize it at all. But no, it's how you play it and who you play it for exactly. and what you're playing it as. Mm -hmm. Are you playing it as a deluded, crazed, frightened, paralyzed human being? Which is fine if you want to play it like that, but you won't be happy and you won't make the deepest contribution. Mm -hmm. Or are you going to really take seriously what the great mystics of all the traditions are saying to us? Enter the game and play your life as a game for God, for the highest values, for the noblest intentions, for the wildest and most beautiful possibilities. And if you play it like that, then you're increasingly divinized yourself. You radiate joy and encouragement and passion and energy to other people, whatever happens. And the life that you lead is one of immensely greater possibility and truth mm -hmm. so, choose oh yeah so i think if we remember as we're in this game that we're also in the audience and right. we're watching all of the costume changes and the set changes and the villains and the heroes right. and we know that it eventually will end and we will still be so that doesn't yes. trivialize the game it just makes us conscious players well, it makes us, in fact, fiercer, clearer players. I think you only really start to play the game properly when you understand that it is in some sense an illusion. It's not the final truth of reality. Mm. And that enables you, because you know you're deathless and because you know that you will not and cannot be defeated in the depths of yourself, that enables you to play the hell and the heaven out of the game, to really give yourself to the full explosion of your mission that's thrilling 
It is so thrilling. What a thrilling journey. <laughs> it is a thrilling journey. And it's getting more thrilling the worse it gets because even more than ever is at stake. Mm -hmm. And when you see that and feel that, and when you've got the peace within your core from the understanding that you are the deathless self through grace, then you can step forward and really play the game for broke. And that's really what we're being asked, all of us at this moment, to do, to understand the divine nature of this game, understand that it's playing the game of the most extreme opposites to birth a new humanity, and enter the game with radiant detachment and even more radiant compassion, and just give everything, go for broke, gamble our lives away for God. That's the most thrilling life. Mm, and so it is. I hope. <laughs> well, it's what you're up to. It's what I'm trying to be up to. It's what I've been up to for quite a while. And I can only say that I can see how terrible things are, but I can also feel the pulse of this astounding new birth. Oh, you and I have no idea what's going to happen. Nobody does. The Dalai Lama doesn't know. Nobody knows what humanity will choose, when it will choose it, whether we will have to be taken beyond the edge of extinction to be able to wake up all of these things are in the mix but what i know is what i've been communicating in my work and in my teachings but also through these books on Kavir and now on angelus Silesius, what i know is that god is limitless love and that love is limitlessly powerful and even and perhaps especially in an extreme situation that love plays games on a level and with the brilliance and with the miraculous truth that can take the top of your head off if you really encounter it mm, thank you and becoming god is the best place to get that on amazon yes i decided to publish it myself because i didn't want anybody else putting their hands on it sure and it has two introductions, as you know, by Mirabai Starr and Matthew Fox, the two greatest living Christian mystics. Mm -hmm. And I have an essay on, on his life. It's a very strange, weird life. <laughs> and then on the reception of the book. So there's an introduction by those two and there's an introduction by me, which sets it in the terms of evolutionary truth. And then there is this mystical symphony. And I've arranged it as a symphony, as you know, in four movements, because... Mm -hmm. This new transfigured intelligence is much, much closer to music than it is to rational linear thought. It's a, a musical intelligence. All the themes come again and again in different configurations, like in a Bach fugue. So if you're going to really have the experience that Angelus is trying to give you, I believe, this musical form is the best form to make it available so that you can go from one insight to another and try and find within yourself the bridge between that. And in that act of reading with that degree of devotion and participation, you yourself taste transfigured consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the chutzpah and the enthusiasm to fling yourself into the furnace of love to be in golden. Mm, beautiful. I, I love that you call him, you, you refer to him as, as fierce, or to his epigrams, as fierce paradoxical directness. I had made a little note of that because I, I thought it was so beautiful and speaks to our dance of opposites that we will continue. <laughs> and it speaks to truth. Truth yeah. is fierce paradoxical directness. Yes. Truth always speaks with the voice of a fiery sword, not to mutilate, but to release and heal and illuminate. And that's what he does. Well, thank you again for a, another wonderful book. Um, we'll just give your website, andrewharvey.net. My re website's ravensinclair.com. And we will continue at another time. Thank you so much. And I really, really beg you, all of you, to give yourself the gift of this book. It's cheap, it's not expensive. Mm -hmm. It costs what you'd spend on a Starbucks breakfast and what you'll have for the whole of your life is a symphony of transfigured consciousness to help you as you allow the divine to birth you into the next level of your evolutionary.
this. Hmm. Thank you, Andrew. Always a pleasure to be with you. My hey. pleasure. <laughs> Till Thank next you. time. Thank you.